I'm going to tie, maybe TC can flip over to the camera there. Um, this other, this fly is a, one of the first flies I developed years ago. Many moons ago, I used to fish on the White River in Arkansas. And uh, we got obsessed with woolly buggers. And we wanted to have something that was a crayfish and a sculpin and something that we could uh, fish with a uh, light tackle rod. Uh, you know, five weight, six weight, stuff like that. So what I developed was the peacock backed woolly bugger. And uh, this originally was a pattern I developed from a thing that Dave Whitlock had called the electric bugger, which was a very large bass bug. And I've caught, oh my God, almost anything on this thing. I don't think there's a species, freshwater species I haven't fished this with. I've caught some really large fish with this. Um, the difference on this is that you're going to use a variety of materials and it's a little more challenging for the average person to do this because you, you've got to do quite a few different things together. Now, the first step is, is we're going to put the bead on the hook. And the hook I'm using is a 9672. It's a number eight. And um, uh, it's a, um, uh, a pretty standard hook. And let me get the tinsel down here. All right, so to begin sliding the bead on the hook, if you guys haven't done this before, and I'll try to do this in front of the camera, is you're gonna put the small eye onto the hook, small eye toward the uh, hook. All right. All right, let's see if I can do this. Okay, and let's see. If it didn't... All right, can you see that okay? Is that good? All right, now the marabou I'm using is olive marabou, and I use a blood quill. And the blood quill, I want this straight on the ends. So you're gonna straighten this and make it roughly equal to the hook shank, okay? All right, so I'll start the thread. We're using black 6-0, that's pretty basic stuff. And you're gonna run the thread down just like on every other bugger. And run it back up a little bit. You wanna to try to build up a base here. And then we're gonna snip off the thread. Okay, the tail, is you're gonna lay the tail on the top. You can do the whole licking thing if you want to and try to keep that equal to the hook shank. And then run up. Now here's a tip to keep your flies neat. Don't crowd your eye. So cut it back a little ways, like one or two eye lengths. And you're gonna crunch this down really good because you're gonna add a lot of stuff here. Okay, now the next item we're gonna add is bronze flash boo. I don't know if you can see the number there. Um, this, you don't need a lot of this. I would say about four strands and you take and fold it over and then you're gonna get a loop. And you wanna tie the loop in so that this doesn't slip. And again, smash that sucker down really good. And then you wanna tie this on the top. Now I'm gonna hold this and I'm gonna straighten this out. Did you see that? So now my tails are even, okay? If you made them a little mistake, you can kind of square that up. All right, now we got regular peacock. If I can find it, darn it, I. All right, and you wanna take uh, four strands. Here's your peacock. And there's the eye, so I'm just gonna rip uh, like four hurls off. And you're gonna fold it in the middle. So you got a loop there again. All right, you're gonna tie that down. Now you wanna tie this back and you wanna be sure that you don't have thread wraps exposed because you're gonna fold this over. Now, if you've got it longer, it won't get mixed in with the tail. 
So this might be a little teeny bit short, but I think we can make that go. All right, we got gold oval tinsel. I don't think it's anything special, just oval tinsel for a rib. And we're gonna put the rib on the, I'll try to do this on the front. Put the rib down. All right. And then I've got variegated chenille. Now this is olive and black variegated. Um, it's something I sell. I don't, it's a Danville product. There's about 10 companies that carry it. Essentially, it's just mixed olive and black. Okay, and you've got a little tag in there. And you want to try to kind of keep that leveled out as much as possible. Run that down, keep smashing it down as much as you can. All right, and then for my hackle, this is variegated uh, Chinese cape, but you can also use a variegated olive saddle. I'm trying to get a sculpin color. Okay, and these are kind of skimpy hackles. So I'm gonna show you a trick here. You can use some of these crappier hackles with. All right, you take two of them, you put the tips together and then you hold this down and then you see how that's at a straight, straight angle. Did, did you see that good? Is that good, TC? Uh, hold it in plane with the hook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah don't pull it, pull it, yeah. All right, so what we're going to do is tie this in by the tip, okay? And the reason for this is you want to try to create the impression that it's much wider than what it is. So we want it to get bushy to get forward to either create the sculpin effect or to create the crawdad effect. All right, we're going to level this out again. Level out, level out. And I bumped the vice. And now we'll wrap the chenille. And you need to do touching turns when you wrap. Okay. And try to leave a little bit of room in your eye and then come up over and above on that and then snip. And what that does, you should have a little bit of room there. All right, now we've got our rib. Gonna run the rib forward in even turns, about five turns, and then we'll snip off. All right, now we'll start to wrap the hackle and we've got two of them here because these are kind of thin. So I'll kind of fuss that around. All right, and then you've got a crazy amount of stuff in here, which is okay. And then you wanna snip this down. And then we're gonna tease this back. All right, now you smash this down and you're gonna pull all your peacock curl over the top. Now, years ago, I originally just did it with Peacock all the straight across. I'm gonna put a loose wrap on there and then one more hard wrap. I'm gonna try to get that last strand. Oh, that's always fun. Maybe not tonight. All right, and you gotta tease all that junk out. All right. Now give this a really good tug. Otherwise those hurls are gonna come off. Okay. And you snip this bit off. All right, and try to wrap that down and then we're gonna whip finish. So let's see where my whip is. All right, now you can put glue on this if you want to. I'm not a big glue person, I'm a big tying person. And if you did it right, then you shouldn't have to glue it. 
All right, so the idea is this, is to create the sculpin and the crawdad at the same time. Now there's a tremendous issue. I got super lucky with this idea um, is that so many of these uh, uh, flies now are articulated, they're giant, they don't cast well, you can't use it with smaller tackle. You can fish this down from a four weight all the way up to a nine weight if you wanted to, but you can do the crawdad and the sculpin, which is really cool because you don't have to carry around all this stuff. If you want it bigger, you can make it bigger and this imitates the claws and then that imitates the head or the, the movement of the, of, the, uh, of the crawdad when it skips. Um, now, the one thing I could tell you is, I, I've got a good story. I was at a place called Nellie's Apron. It's where the Buffalo River and the White come in. And there's a huge drop off and I saw two really big trout in there. And I uh, wasn't sure what to do. I figured I have like one shot slide in a fly. So I tied this on and I, I got back and I cast it and I let it fall over the side, fell down over the side and bam, just nailed a freaking brute. And that was insane. Cause I got to watch it come up from the bottom of the pool, chase it as I was pulling it back and then I grabbed the fly. So that was pretty cool. So the peacock bugger, you can take a simple idea, make it more complicated, make it more interesting. But look, you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven materials you don't have to tie yourself into that same idea. This is what I want you to take away from this. Take something that's common, ordinary, add your twist to it and make it something that works for you. So I think that this, as surprisingly enough, Bob Clouser came up with his swimming nymph, which looks vaguely similar. And then uh, Borger has a similar fly too. So I knew I was in a pretty good neighborhood when I developed this. So that's the peacock bugger. All right, so I'm going to uh, transition here just a minute. And the next fly we have is um, a fly that I developed quite a while ago. And this is going to be in fly tire, but it's not been printed yet. It's in the queue to be done. Now there's quite a little story with this. Um, a number of years ago, my wife was a visiting professor at UBC, uh, University of British Columbia. Now, why did you care about that? Well, she was gone, so I went fishing. And uh, I had to take care of the dogs, fed the dogs, and I went and fished the dray catch up at Skinny Atlas. And I was really determined to hit that right. So I went out like every night for, oh, about two weeks. And um, what I found was, maybe I'll switch to the other camera. What I found was I was looking for a drake, okay? I wanted something that was an emerger, but something I could see, something that would float ridiculously well and something I could cast. Now this raised all kinds of different issues because I had foam flies, I had the merger, I had this and that. And you know, after two weeks, I was like, oh, come on, we gotta come up with something. All right, so what I did was I robbed Fran Better's fly, the, uh, the usual, and I crossed that with uh, the transitional done from, uh, um, oh, the fellow's name slips me now. It's a guy out in Idaho. Um, oh my goodness. Um, anyway, he had the transitional done, which was a CDC fly. So I combined the transitional done and I use snowshoe feet and I put those two together. And what this is, is a snowshoe emerger for a drake. This thing is a ridiculously good fish catcher because the wing allows it to float, it traps air and then you can pop it. So in the stream, what you'll do is you're gonna cast this down and across and then you jerk it really hard and it pops to the surface, just like a drake. And then when they pound this thing, it just, they're either gonna smack it or they're not. So out in the lake, what I could do is get this thing wet and then pull it really hard to the surface and then it would pop, pop up. And so this is tied intentionally really big and it's overdressed to try to trap that air pocket to be that Drake emerger. And uh, so this is every bit of a New York born and bred fly. And now what we'll use is you wanna use a too long uh, uh, Daiichi hook, it's a 1710. And you want to use a number 10 hook. So let me see if I've got the right hook. Here's a 12, this work too. 
a 10 or a 12, the 12 works good. Um, let's see, here, maybe I got this one here, let's do that. All right, so you've got a Daiichi 1710, a two long hook. Now I use orange thread, which is Danville uh, 60. And you're gonna lay down a base for this. And there's my woodpecker making lots of noise. Okay, so you cover up the hook shank. That's pretty simple. All right, and then we're gonna do the tail. This is woodchuck. Okay, can you see that pretty good? Okay, so it's woodchuck. All right, so you're gonna snip a pinch. And here's a pinch. Now, if you hold it real close, you can get most of that junk out. All right, and then I'm gonna stack it. I put it into a hair stacker. I don't know if you can see that. I'll try to grab it. All right, so you grab it real quick and you set it equal to the hook shank. All right, and then you wanna come down. I wanna leave the head space open. I do not wanna overpack that. And then you wanna lay that down really nicely so it has a little jump there. Now this is red wire, um, you're gonna use as a rib. You need about two inches of red wire, maybe inch, I don't know. All right, now in the dubbing, I've got two flavors of dubbing. There is hair's ear and then dark done. So here's the hair's ear and there's the dark done. Okay, I don't know, can you see that good? All right, so the darker is what you're gonna use for the head. And then you're gonna use the lighter for the body. And the reason for that is you wanna create a transition. And don't be shy about the dubbing. You can really overdub this thing. It's not gonna hurt it one darn bit because it's a very thick fly. So I actually spin the dubbing backwards I'm going to roll this. Oop, I'm hitting that thing. All right. All right. So I'm going to leave that head open because I'm going to have a really big wing in there. So you really only got maybe a, like a third of the fly that you really dub. And you wrap the rib and use the red wire to give that a contrast. You can use orange wire if you want or brown. I don't think that really matters. All right, we're gonna cut the wire. Now, who's ever worked with snowshoe feet, the critical part is breaking the toes. See how the toes are split? What you'll do is stick a screwdriver into the snowshoe feet. And so you want it to look like this. The reason for that is the best stuff is really between the toes right here. So that is one of the key critical things to working with snowshoe feet is to break the toes. And then you're gonna reach down here and you're gonna cut a bunch. Now, if you're used to working with feather wings, you wanna tie this as a lot thicker than what you think. You're gonna use about double the amount of fur that you normally would. And you can start reducing the volume by pulling some of that junk off, but I use a kid's tick comb and I try to take all that out of there, that bottom stuff. Okay, so that takes out a lot of that wool. Now to get your tips even, you hold your tips here. If you cut it straight, you would have done a pretty good job. There's not a lot of uneven ends. That's very fussy stuff. If you don't get your wing straight, I don't think the fish is gonna care. Now you want that to come to the bend of your hook and it's gotta be fairly full. If you don't have it thick enough, it really is not gonna float well. So you tie one, two, three wraps 
and then you're going to snip this down at about 45. And then we're going to cover this over. I like to keep it tapered because this is going to make a better kind of a base for the, the wing. All right, then you really got to crank down on this a lot. Try to level this out. All right, that's good. If you want to throw one behind there, and eh, that wouldn't hurt. You could do that, might push it up a little bit. All right, now the next thing we've got is a brown Indian saddle. Uh, these are speckle backs. You want a fairly wide feather because this is going to imitate the legs. So I'm going to pull the feather off and then I'm going to pull this junk off right here. Pull that off. And then we wrap it. I'm going to wrap it like that, but I'm going to put it on my side. So let's see. All right, so wrap that down and then we'll snip off the stem. Okay, now you're gonna have to kind of fuss with this to get it to go. And you could just, we'll deal with that in just a second here and make a lot of wraps because you're gonna cut some of this off anyhow. All right, we'll snap, snip this off. And then at the end, I'm gonna cut the legs, but I wanna to try to level this out a little bit. There's a few strands in there. Now you wanna get this leveled because you're gonna make a really big oversized head. And the idea with that is almost, if I could get away with deer hair, I probably would have spun some deer hair in here, but, uh, uh, you're, you can put dressing on this and it'll float like a cork. All right. Now you run the dubbing back up here like that. No, oh, it jumped off. All right, wait a minute. Uh, it's a bit too much. I'm going to have to fuss with this a second here. All right, that's pretty good. Now you come up here and then you tie into this a little bit to form this and this will help bind that up. And then we're gonna whip finish, and then we'll put a bit of glue in there to help hold that hip fur from coming apart so much. You can just dab that with a little head cement, and then when it gets hard, you can kind of scrunch it after it's dried. Now, the other thing to do is you wanna turn this over and you're gonna cut this out, the legs because you don't want that to interfere with the hooking potential of the fly. So that's a snowshoe Drake emerger. Linetsky and Filter renamed this the cornhole fly. I don't know why. They thought that was pretty hilarious. So I guess that's the name of it is the cornhole emerger, but it's really a, a, a Drake emerger. But you can fish this down a lot smaller. I fish this as a 12 or a 14. The problem is when you start doing that, then the wing gets too bunchy. But even on a big size, you know, like on some of these bigger flies that'll come off on these early season, they'll still crack that pretty good. And uh, it's got uh, um, it's got good floatability and you can see it like nobody's business. So for some folks that are having trouble seeing a fly, that's pretty darn easy to see. Okay, so that's the snowshoe emerger. Um, now, while I'm kind of getting set up here, we'll tell another story. A while ago, I was up in Pulaski and I was salmon fishing. I always go into fishing stores. I guess it's kind of a sickness, you know, do I need more fishing stuff? I sell the darn stuff. I've got all kinds of things. But I'm always looking to see what people are doing or whatever. And the one fly I came up with 
was so interesting. I've been working on this for a while and I actually don't have a name for it and I haven't published this anyplace. So this is like a first time every, anywhere for this. This is something from last fall. I think what we'll call it is the Finger Lake Special, but it's a fly designed for fishing, for smallmouth bass, uh, for uh, salmon, for brown trout, rainbows. And the one thing is I fish with the six weight a lot and I don't want something that's articulated. I don't want something that's a dish mop. I don't want something that's hard to throw. And I want something that's got incredible action. Now what this does is it allows, it gets in the water and these things will brush out and it acts like a, something much bigger and it's got incredible action, but it collapses. So you can throw this sucker with almost a five weight uh, and it doesn't have that dish mop thing like those double bunnies and all that stuff. So what we did was we crossed about four different flies and there was a fly I saw in Pulaski that was vaguely similar to this. Honestly, God, I have no idea who developed it. It was just a streamer box, maybe I think in one of the fly shops and they didn't even know what it was. Uh, but I've tied this in a bunch of different colors. This is the perch color that you would use maybe in the spring here because the rainbows are not liking uh, bluegills and they'll attack those perches just voraciously and pound those things senselessly. Now what I use is, there's another interesting thing is that trivs have a half inch gap spread on a hook. That's the biggest hook you can put on there. So this is a 9674 number four. Now the one weirdness is a lot of you guys are used to tying the the eye upside down. So you're gonna tie the eye upside down. On this fly, we are tying it on the other side, on the, you would tie it, uh, you would tie the, the eye on the top of the hook so it would swim upside down. On this one, we're gonna tie it exactly opposite because I want it to track straight. So I use a 9674, number four, and then I have lead eyes, the lead eyes, are just a plated uh, medium lead eye uh, or painted lead, uh, medium lead eye. All right, so we're gonna put this on here. You're gonna cross hatch this and then we'll paint this thing with super glue. I'll show you one trick that you might not know or maybe you do know. All right, you do this. Now, if you spin your thread around here, this acts to really tighten this thing up. Okay, and then I'm gonna use, I've got the thinned out uh, Z-Mint, or you can use head cement or zap gap. I don't think it matters so much, but I wanna be sure that those eyes are pretty well locked down. Now, my next item that I'm gonna tie in These are uh, barred bunny strips. And I think this particular genre is a wopsy one. Hey, Mike. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned that, that that's thinned out. How, how do you thin out that uh, Z-Man? Oh, it comes that way. It, it's about half the consistency of the regular uh, Zappa Gap. Um, it's just called Z-Mint. So it's supposed to be like a zap a gap head cement, but that's what it's called, Z-Mint. Okay. Can you see that? Uh, how about that? Uh, that's been out for about, I don't know, three or four years maybe. Okay, so we go to do our tail. You want to set the tail equal to the hook shank. And now you've got to pinch this on. Okay. And you could put wraps of glue on, paint the glue on there. I don't know. I don't think that really matters. And then the body for this is Palmer chenille. This is what you call medium Palmer chenille. And you can make this any color. The colors that we've been using so far have been a root beer combination, the white 
and uh, then the olive. Now the one trouble with this is you've got, it, it is kind of fussy because there's a bias to this thing. So you've got to wrap this and then it'll kind of brush out and then you can kind of straighten it out a little bit. But what happens when this stuff gets in the water is it flares up and it gives this impression of this, you know, large minnow thing without having all this junk and it collapses when you cast it, which is really cool. So, um, all right, see now I'm getting kind of a, this smashed right here. I'm getting stuck on my glue. So I'm gonna have to twist that out a little bit. Uh, but uh, we used the uh, white pretty good. I caught salmon on that and I caught some migratory rainbows on that. Uh, and if you wanna mix up the colors, you can, you know, brown or green or white or black. Uh, we tried purple and black. We didn't have a great deal of success with that, but uh, that worked pretty good for salmon. All right, you wanna leave a little bit of room for the collar because we're gonna use a feather for the collar. All right, I'm gonna go back to the variegated Chinese neck, but you could use certainly saddle hackle or hen hackle. Um, I don't think it really matters that much, just something to give you a little bit of uh, thickness to imitate the sculpin kind of stuff. All right, I'm gonna strip off that bottom and then we'll cut the stems off. Tie this in here. All right, and then we'll wrap this. All right, we'll take maybe about three or four wraps. And then I'm gonna snip that off. And now I'm going to pull this back because I want it as a collar and I'm going to line into this just a little bit. So what that does is make it as a collar. All right. Now there's two options you got for the head. You can dub it or if you're truly lazy, then you just put chenille on it. And if you're really wanting to crank out a bunch of these, just put the chenille on it. I don't think the fish are going to care. Here's the olive we had from before. Uh, let me try this. Uh, I have another olive. Oh, here we go. This is plain olive right here. You could try using some Estaz. You could put sparkle yarn in there. What you want to do is build up the head and cover the eyes and stuff up. Again, what you want to do is create this as your pattern, something that works for you. Okay, so you can roll over the eye, you can roll over this eye. All right, then come back this way, over the top, over the top. And that should be pretty good. And then we'll clip this off and then we're gonna do the whip finish. And a little bit of feather sticking through there. All right, do the whip. And now you can shrink this down. You could go down to the number six on this, but I don't think you wanna go in number eight and you can certainly go up to a number two. But I'm thinking that four is about all you need because you can still throw that with the six weight. Now, if you look, see, this is not gonna get fouled up. This collapses and you've got a lead eye and you increase your thing to a, uh, your uh, tippet to a two X or a zero X and then you don't have problems with that folding. So um, this again is a new pattern. I don't really have a name for it but I think we'll just call it the Finger Lake Special. 
because uh, we're going to fish that in white, the uh, olive and chartreuse, and then the tan, and maybe purple and black. And uh, the whole idea I've got with any kind of thing like this, I want to try to solve a lot of problems. First of all, can you cast it? Second of all, when you throw it, can you fish it well? Then the next question you want is, does it pick up? Does it track straight? So when you design something, there's a multitude of things that you have to try to solve and you can't always do it with every single pattern. The thing that I've seen that's troublesome about so many of these streamers is there's just so much stuff. It's massive, you can't throw it, then this thing doesn't cast and then you gotta get it in the water, you gotta pull it against the current. You have 18 million pieces of materials to use. On this, you got one, two, three, four materials. You got your lead eyes, that's pretty much it. And then again, it will compact and then this flares up when it gets in the water at a pulse. And it's got a lot of movement to it. So it's got fish cap catching capabilities. And I don't know, usually I think, you know, when I come across something like this, it's a winner because what I want to do is make it simple, but effective. That's the two criteria. So, I don't know, what do you guys think? Is that have you, cool? Have you, um fish uh, for smallmouth or warm water species with that, Mike? I did a little bit last fall and the olive was the, this one was the best bet. The mm -hmm. olive one, I'll put that one back in there. Uh, the white one, I fished that for uh, salmon and uh, we had some, some of the salmon hit that pretty good on the white. Um, so, this doesn't really show that you, the UV stuff in the water really just kicks that on. It just, and it, it's something about that with that pulsing in there that makes it really attractive. So, um, but uh, I thought that was a pretty cool idea. So, um, anybody got any questions? Uh, it doesn't appear so. I'm, I'm seeing some uh, head nodding nose. Um, that you're a really effective tire. Let me just say that <laughs> you're, you're you're really uh, efficient. Um, so another thing, you know, we had a tying session uh, last month with Joe Cambridge, and he tied the usual. So it's cool to see that second fly, your uh, kind of combination fly there. But another thing Joe alluded to is that he. You know, he shares, you know, Hogue's got this new stuff. So, um, you know, we talked, could you, you know, share what's kind of new in fly tying and do a showcase of some products you have in mind that, you know, may have, may be of interest to us? To... Okay. Um, yeah, we can jump into that. Let me get situated here. Okay. And we'll go through these items. Um, let's see. I don't know if we have any music or interlude here. <laughs> um, I could tell jokes, but the jokes I tell used to tell, I would get arrested for now. I think <laughs> so. Um, there's politically incorrect. And then there's what I used to tell. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, one thing we'll start with is a product that I helped develop. Um, I got, ooh, I gotta find that first. Uh, oh, shoot, in there. All right, okay, let's hold these up. All right, so did anybody see Eric Masterbirdie's talk? Um, he was talking about foam blocks. Okay, um, these are called feather preppers. And this just came out literally a week ago. I helped Hairline develop this. Um, what I did was approach Hairline. There is a bunch of these kind of grab it tweezer type of tools. And what you do is you push the feather down into the blocks and then you grab it with the tool to pull it up. And this allows you to gather materials or to mix materials or to mix or to bend feathers and to fold feathers. A traditional way to fold the hackle is you take the hackle, pull it down like this, and then bend it this way, and then you have to wrap it. With this, you just push them into the blocks, and then you fold it. And uh, 
this is a solution to some ridiculously machined products. There are these European blocks that are like $40. And these are 12 bucks for the big one. And then the smaller one is uh, seven twenty-five. So let me let so, me uh, let me ask a question there, Mike. So is that is that a um, what Eric demonstrated was? Um, it's a commercial a, version of marrying, that. Well, he he demonstrated marrying wings. So is yep. that is that something where you would where you would stack your your feathers in the those columns to help aid in that? Um, it'd be more like, okay, so let's say you wanted to put a partridge, a CDC feather and some flash on one oh, rope, okay. right? So you could take three feathers and punch them into that, or you can put some flash into there, or you could take different colors or you could take different media. So you can put deer hair feathers, flash. I right? see. I see. Yep. All right. Oh. The idea with that block is, is it gives you something to hold so you can grab with. Right. So you push it into the slot and then you can grab it with that. That is actually a really, really old idea. For years, people use that giant block like this and cut razor blade marks in it and stuff like that. What reason I'm doing this is not every guy is going to want to sit down and carve out blocks and do this. You know, mm -hmm. just grab this and go. It's made up. You don't have to fiddle with it. We figured out the proportions and we figured out the sizes. Neat. So that that's a really cool new item, and I helped them develop that. I can't say that I did it 100%, um, but I certainly contributed to that. Um, okay, now there's another brand new thing. This just came out literally this week. Hey, Mike. Yeah. Uh, just just to uh, explain a little bit more. Uh, so I think you're referring to the demonstration that. Eric did for the Leon Chandler to you. Uh, oh, okay. Um, but but it was really cool, uh, and he used a magic eraser for the host, uh, and and so this item would take the place of that. Um, and what he had did was uh, used a CDC and and a hackle mix, um, which was really interesting. Uh, but you can imagine there's a lot of different uh, materials that you can blend or uh, prepare with uh, with a block like uh, you're you're now selling. Yep. And what it is, it's just convenience. It's so you can do this. You can fiddle with it. You've got different sizes. You've got the small one. You've got the bigger one. And you've got different size blocks and different size slots in there. And we, I questioned him about you know, like using wood duck and partridge, you know, how cool would that be to fold wood duck and then to fold partridge or another one. Here's one that if you're old time tire working with bronze mallard, bronze mallard's a nightmare because when you split it, the fibers just crumble. So you usually have to split the stem and pull a segment of the stem. But with this, you can force the feather bent, grab it and then dump it into a loop. So it, it solves a lot of problems. And here's the thing, it puts it into your budget. You don't have to send away to Europe to order a $500, a $40 block. So um, now this one is a ridiculously expensive tool. I'm not gonna lie, this is brand new. It is called the nesting stacker. Okay, so this is, I don't know, what is that? Five inches maybe? Okay, so you have the first stacker and you have the base, which comes apart. Then you have another stacker which comes apart. And then you have two more stackers. Okay, so you've got the baby. You've got the large and then you got the daddy jumbo. Okay, one problem you have working with bucktail is to try to find a large stacker, is to try to find the big size and uh, so anyway, these all nest, they go one into the next, and then they go into a travel pouch. I'm not gonna lie, this is an expensive tool. These are 150. So these are made in Italy, and the guy that designed this was Barry Ord Clark. He's called the feather bender. So the stacker is called the TFB, the feather bender. And then this goes into a cool little pouch. 
So you want to know what's new? That literally just came out. Now, there are some other tools that you haven't seen that are new that I had imported. This is a first one right here as another stacker. Okay, what happens here is you have, there's three bases. Uh, I don't know if you can see those. And this is the same concept as in the nesting deal. So you can change the base and change the length. So you have three different sizes all in one deal. And then these are six bucks. So this is the mic version of something like that. Now you go the other way and you have a terrible problem finding micro stackers. And this is machined brass. So it's a micro stacker. Yeah, and I don't know if you can see it, but this is for every bit of really tiny stuff. Um, and that again is six bucks. Those are important. Now, my tool maker over in India said that he sold 12,000 of these things in Japan. These are crazy. This is a weighted bobbin. Okay, these are cast brass feet that are extra heavy. Now, why do you want that? Because it does this, boom. It's gonna lay right in the bottom. And you put your regular size uh, thread in there and then it's got a really heavy edge on the side. These are 12 bucks. So this is totally brand new. I don't think anybody's ever seen that because I'm probably one of the first guys to have it. Uh, one of the new products this fall, um, can you see that? Okay, that's called feed a bead. Now there's a wire and a loop. Maybe if I show on the back, you can see that better. There's a wire and a loop and a kind of a cone. A bead up in the cone, push the wire through it and then pull it out and then it, you're able to slide it onto the hook. Now this goes does not take super tiny hooks and it, or beads, and it does not do well with really large beads, is what I'm told. So this fits, the average tire is the 530 seconds to 764. And you get one, two, three, four, five, and it has a little foam deal. So you can lay these out, string them up, or you can string a whole bunch of them together and then feed it onto the hook. So you can take your pack of 20 or 10 or 12 or whatever, scoop them all on there, and then it locks like a safety pin. So that's pretty cool. All right, now we have some more expensive Italian tools. Uh, this is the copper bodkin. Okay, this is completely machined with a sanded tip. And uh, this has an extra fine point. And then it has a really rigid stiff point. Now, why, why do you want this? If you are marrying wings where you want to split fibers, bendy bodkins will drive you up the deep end. It would push you right over the cliff. Because what this does is allow you to split and split it tiny and crack one fiber at a time so you can marry all these different segments together. This is marketed toward the salmon guys. These are 24 bucks. Now, going along with that bodkin is the ridiculously uh, sharp pointed tweezers, and these are machined. These are precision tools. They're not that deal you get at Walmart where you're gonna, you know, pull things and yank stuff with it. These are precision ground, and these are made by a uh, professional uh, barber shear company in Italy. So these have a uh, fine point tip, and those are 36 bucks for those. Now, if that hasn't broken your budget yet, Copter has these really cool scissors. These are precision ground scissors that are ring locked. I'll get these out. And these have serrated micro edges on it. They have extra fine tips. And these you can snip individual strands and individual threads with them. Uh, I've surprisingly sold quite a few of those. Those are pretty pricey too. These are, uh, I believe, 60 bucks. 
There is a different model, which is 45, that has a different handle. Essentially, it has a shorter tip to them. But again, these are being marketed toward the salmon high-end type of guys. And they're not for the average person, but if that's something you're looking for, that might be the ticket. This is really cool. This is the multi-loop. Let me see if I can get this thing out. Um, ooh, I don't know if I can get this out without tearing the card. The multi-loop tool from Swiss CDC. Last year, the Swiss CDC clamp was a really big seller. And this is a spinning loop tool. It has a precision CNC cut, which allows you to loop the thread around. And then it has a weight so you can flip it and turn it and spin it. Now, uh, what you can do is make loops and then it has a lot of weight and it's balanced so it doesn't flop side to side. A lot of the things, even though I sell those, some of the dubbing spinners I have are gonna wobble and they'll do this. This does track very, very straight and it is machined and it has different loops to allow you to do different things. So you can put in a section, put a stop in it, put another piece in and put a stop in it. There is a video on that, the multi-loop Swiss CDC tool. You might wanna watch that. The first one of those I saw was in German and that was kind of like, oh, okay, that's a little much, but there is an American one floating around there somewhere. Now, this is actually pretty cool. This is the eye embellishing tool. Uh, this has a kind of a sticky end to this. Now, if any of you have stuck your eyes to your forehead, stuck them to the table, stuck them anywhere but on the bug, then this might solve your problems as a little sticky end. So what you're gonna do is grab the eye, stick it on there and hold it as a little thing so you can glue that sucker down. And this surprisingly is pretty cheap. Uh, hairline markets that it's 650. Another crazy expensive uh, European product is the guy with the absolute worst marketing name of all time, Schmagen. The Schmagen bobbins. These are CNC machined. The original ones had a little uh, uh, wheel that twisted. And this has a ceramic tip, it's CNC machined and has a precision ground uh, uh, tip. This one, uh, our barrel, this is the mid one, there's a standard one. So this is gonna hold tighter, you're gonna have less slippage with this and this does fit your hand very well. It, is crazy expensive though that one is 49 bucks so don't want to shoot the messenger but you guys asked what's cool and believe it or not i've sold a bunch of those all righty let's see the next item is we're going to talk about egg yarn which is not my thing but i want to tell you what is cool and what is new all right, so a while ago, let's see if we can zoom in on this. What's that? Um, can you zoom in on that one? Yeah. All right. All right, years ago, okay, wait a minute, let me get the other flight. Years ago, when we started egg fishing, you fished something like that, it was a dough ball. So it was a spun yarn, you did it, you cut it in a circle. The next generation was the Estes. So you wrap the Estes and then you just uh, dab glue on it. Believe it or not, those are extremely effective flies. Now what's happened is you're gonna jump up one more level and you've got the slushy eggs. So let me see if I can get this over here. All right, so the slushy eggs, what this does is that material compresses and it literally is like, it, it's like jelly. It's insane what this stuff is. There's the eggs to see material and then the FNF. The FNF came first and then eggs to see. Eggs to see, I'm told Orvis can't even keep this stuff on the shelf. They're selling so many packs of this stuff. And it makes it squishy, so it makes it like it's it's a, a real chewy material. And related to that is the chewy olive chenille. 
The chewy olive chenille, what people are doing is using this as a tail with those uh, egg type materials. And uh, this is the hot stuff, believe it or not. So if you look up slushy eggs, essentially what they're using is a jig hook and then you just a couple wraps of that yarn and that's it. And then that's the slushy eggs. Another thing that is not mine. Yeah. And they go back to that chewy chenille. Um, so, so is that kind of like a micro mop or? Uh, what it is, it's a rubberized. Uh, um, let's see if I can get the strand up here. It's rubberized and it stretches a little bit. So it, it's got like rubber maybe that's cut. I think it looks to me like there's rubber strands that are cut tight. So can you see that? How's that? I can't, well, I can't tell uh, from the picture, but we trust you that it's rubber. Oh yeah, that, that helps. All right, I'll try to tug on it. See, it kind of springs. Yeah. It's not, it's a little more durable than the gummy, but it's not, it's a kind of elastic, kind of stretchy. So it is an alternative to a gummy. Yeah, you could use this like a gummy. They're using this like tails and then they put that with the ecstasy. Huh. So those things go pretty much together. And there's, a, of course, 20 colors of this stuff. You know, uh, you've got the worm colors in this one and the other ones are the glow bright. Um, now we can do this maybe over here. There's some new mop chenille. Hairline has this, and I've actually sold a lot of this stuff too. This is called UV Galaxy. Okay, and it's a mop piece, and then it's got the sparkle in it. And then they have the UV mop variegated, and then this has the variegated material in that. So can you, did you see that pretty good? Um, so, so that has like black and UV material mixed into it. This has a little more density than the regular mop stuff. Um, the regular mop stuff is kind of floppy. Okay. Okay, I'll hold some other stuff up here. All right, here's another new material. It's called polar goat hair. All right, so uh, years ago I sold kid goat hair and uh, the one kid goat hair is ridiculously hard to get, but this stuff has got really sweet texture to it and it's got a lot of length to it. So this is about five inches. My friend is Steve Solero is a guy that's on the Arex team and then the Regal team. He makes all this stuff with Polar Pony. And uh, this is about as good a stuff as I've seen compared to the Polar Pony. He, does, he can't get that anymore. So uh, that is uh, seven bucks for that. Pretty nice item. Um, let's see. Now, one thing the Bex brought back. Let's try over here, maybe. We can see that better. Okay, poly fluff. What this is, I don't know if anybody uses Enrico stuff, but that's a lot of combed Antron, but this is used to be L&L's high viz. And this was marketed for a long, long, long time. And the Bex brought it back. And this is uh, essentially trout material. You're gonna use this as shucks, posts, and spinner wings, that type of stuff. It has a good texture, it floats well, and it doesn't compress. Um, I like the uh, old L and L, so that's why I brought that one back. Um, hey, Mike. Another one. Yeah. Material. It's called poly fluff. The original material was called high viz, and then uh, uh, the Bex marketed that as poly fluff. Okay. And uh, uh, poly fluff was something they sold in their catalog years ago when they had the store. So this is it a, a fine polypropylene. Uh, it's a combed out Antron, so it's a little bit softer than what the Xelon is, and it's not so staticky as like Antron is. Um, it's fairly, I don't know if you want to call it clumpy, but it, it doesn't, 
I don't know. It, it's a good fiber because it doesn't really bind up like poly does. You know, poly will mat and get kind of compressed, and then this doesn't do that. I believe that's right. I believe that's the material that um, Joe Cambridge was re referencing. Um, I had to step out real quick. Was that by Barry and Kathy back? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. I, I actually told Kathy to send him a sample. Okay. And uh, because I know he had used that for a long, long time. Yeah. So, um, and he said, yeah, that was really, it was really cool. And uh, it is good stuff because I used to use the high vis. The one thing that the Bex didn't do is do like chartreuse orange and maybe uh, uh, pink or something like that for post, you know, but maybe that those are colors that they used to have. Uh, this right here, um, which one do you want me to go to the other one? Okay, I have sold so much of this. I even hate to tell you guys about this. This is called peccary or javelina. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this, but I have sold a ton of this. The fibers are ridiculously stiff. This is a fiber that goes on the clean camera and you wind it and it's variegated, but it's also hollow. So it's going to create a body that goes white, black, white, black, and but then it makes it kind of fat and segmented. And uh, these are actually feral pigs from Texas. The guys, uh, uh, it's interesting. Um, I did a, kind of played a, pro, a prank on the Wopsy guys. And Wopsy, I got this whole hide and it had the cape, which is the cape is the head. And it had the ears and the nose. And most of these things don't have very good noses and ears and stuff on them because they're, you know, they're blasted. And so I, I called up Wopsy and I said, you know, I have the ultimate... Um, uh, Arkansas Razorback and they go what's that and I said I got a javelina and I said normally you guys would pay about 600 bucks for this and he goes what do you want and I said I don't know trade me something I'll, I'll put it in a box and put it on the boss's desk see if you have a little fun with it and so the ops manager TL they put it like in his chair and he came in and he's like so happy you know because there's a Razorback but see the the the, the, the fun part with that is he's the Tennessee fan of the whole bunch because he went to you know, UT and all well, the other lot went to Arkansas. So anyway, so yeah, so I don't know. Our, uh, Wopsy thought that was pretty cool, but this is peccary. I've sold a bunch of that. All right. Now there's a couple of cool things that are floating around and I'll try to put this over here. Uh, can you see that okay? Or wait a minute, hard for me to tell. Right there, right up there. Right there. There. Oh, okay. All right. These are modeled uh, beads that are slotted. Okay. And this is really crazy hot with all that check bunch. I don't know if you can see the modeling or not. What it is, it's two colors. And you have like brown with tan with brown, and then you have green with green. And they're speckled and there's a bunch of other colors that are speckled but the speckled modeled beads are the really hot ticket with that nymphing crowd right now i don't know why but apparently that's that's the end thing so those are pretty popular uh my buddy petagene has a new tool and this is a thread splitter that's precision ground i don't know we're getting all this precision ground stuff and we're paying for that but this has a slot for your fingers in there, and then it has a very fine tip. What he does is he splits the thread, and then he does that uh, uh, kind of block thing, but he does it with the magic tool, and then he puts stuff into the split thread and twists it. So you need to have a good tip on this, and then this also has a finger pad so that you can uh, put your fingers on it. That, unfortunately, is 20 bucks, so that's a fairly pricey item. Uh, this one is the bead ruler. Okay, and this is six inches long, has a scale with all the different sized beads. So if you can't figure out what the beads are, one side, well, nope, that's all English. I thought one side was metric and the other is English. But it has English, all the bead sizes. And I have sold so many of these rulers. I was ordering these every week for a while. And uh, these are crazy cool. This is, uh, silk screened and it's a steel ruler so that's uh 10 bucks and that's one that hairline's importing okay now we can talk about some feathers all right uh, 
Yeah, let me just switch to the other one. All right, our buddy Bill Keo, of course, raises chickens. And I had a discussion with Keo quite a long time ago. I told him about the intro packs and he kind of poo-pooed this. Well, what's happening is there are not capes. Uh, most of that stuff that Whiting has had is going over to the Japanese for some reason. They're buying up all the capes and there isn't anyone anywhere. And same with his multi-pack. So this is four half capes. You get black or you get brown, grizzly, dark down and white, 45 bucks, which is a scream and steal because most of the capes are $65 for one or 35 bucks for the half a cape. Now I got a little aggravated with some finding some materials. So this is a mic product. Uh, this is barred. It's a grizzly that's strung. Okay. And I had this dyed up by John McLean's a salmon guy in six colors. So the disadvantages on the Grizzly, this is only six inches. Most of the strung hackle you see using is the six to nine, seven to eight, something like that. It's a little bit shorter, but these are Grizzly and they have very good fibers to them. Whereas a lot of this stuff that is quote barred is chinchilla. So this is a little better quality. I have these for six bucks, but I have five colors. Another item I have, and I brought this tonight because I thought this was fun. I don't think many people have seen Cree hen necks, but I have some. I have an account with Mets and I buy hackle from them direct. And that allows me to buy things that they can't package or market easily. What happens is they have items that don't fit their kind of quote catalog thing. And so she'll save a lot of this stuff for me. So this is a Cree hen neck. Is that, is that better color? And so it's got the Cree and it's got the three color mix and then it's got good chips to it. So you can make a lot of wet flies with that. Those are 35 bucks for the Cree. And that is comparable to what the whitings are going for. Most of those are 30, 35 bucks. But this is extremely rare. I don't get many of those pieces. Another cool one, many people have read the Liza Ring books and one of the things he talks about is the honey done. And so there is the honey done. And I have that. This has a little bit of dark done in the centers on this one. So uh, Metz is calling this ginger brown, but this is their version of the honey done. It's not quite the same as the ones that Whiting has. Whiting has a little more ginger in the center instead of the dark centers. Mike, is that is that hen? Is that a hen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a hen cape. Yep. These are all hen capes. And then this is a really cool one too. A very rare critter is the water hens. And so this is Met's chocolate done. And if you look at the tinges in here, there's a mix of gray, brown, and a little bit of kind of blonde in the tips. And this is a variant that they can't really classify. So I have her save these for me. And this is Man, that's as close to water hand as you're ever going to get without getting the water hand. And this has got a good price of 25 bucks, so it's not out of the ballpark for that. Um, now for the soft tackle guys, I actually have golden plovers. I don't know if anybody's ever seen these. These are really hard to get. I don't publicize this because these are so hard to get that they usually sell out right straight away. The golden plover has uh, done with gold chips in it. Yeah. yeah. And this is a full pelt. So it's got the wings, the tail, and then it's got the scalp on there. And it's got even the little tiny ones in there. So I'm not sh these come from Scotland, I believe. And what happens is they uh, migrate and travel from Norway. So there's a very limited season for shooting them and for shooting them when they have the golden cover color. They've talked about protecting those. I don't know if they can or not, but maybe they shoot them in Norway. I'm not really sure. But those are items that we don't have in the United States at all. Um, now I have some very nice quails. Hey Mike. Yeah. How much does the uh, golden plover sell for? Oh, you don't want to know. 80 bucks. 80 bucks, no good. 80 bucks. Yep. I had to put it up that high. 
uh, I actually was getting 10 bucks for a small packet and the wings, I got 20 bucks for those. So you've got a pretty good supply of those, a pretty good amount. You could split that with somebody too, you know, just cut the thing in half. And um, so the, the plovers are pretty pricey. I don't get very many of them though. All right, so uh, we have American species of wet fly hackle that usually you don't have this overseas. They were birds that only existed in the United States. So a lot of the old guys used, you went to a market, like imagine, you know, you go to the farmer's market and you pick out your bird. You know, you picked out your pheasant, you picked out, you know, this bird, that bird, that bird. People shot them, they took them to the market and you hung them and you actually wanted them to lay out for a bit to quote cure, whatever that meant. I imagine it was pretty ripe after a few days, but they would often would sit seven to 10 days before you'd eat them, which no wonder people got sick. All right, so you went to the bird market. The guys ate the bird and then what did they do with it? Well, they made flies with it. Well, and the reason that a lot of these American birds were never, quote, in pattern books, they didn't have them over there. So, um, so these are American soft tackles. This is a Bob White quail. And All right, so you got a mix of tan, you got a mix of brown, and then you have mottled feathers. The one problem you have with quails often is the stems are a little bit thick on there. So usually what I do when I do that is I either take a spoon or my thumb and then I run it along the stem to flatten the quails out. That one is the Bob White. And then this one is the Gambles right here. Now the Gambles is from Arizona. So this guy has a little top knot on there. I don't know if you can see that, maybe that's better. They're dark gray and he's got a chestnut head and then he's got the top knot. And then the back is got olive tinges with gray and brown mixed. That's the gambles. And then this one is a valley quail. And I've also got scaled. Oh yeah, this is the valley quail. So the valley quail has different gray in there and has the different colors. Now I had a guide who's in Arizona and he's one of the top uh, quail shooters in the United States. And years ago, I used to deal with a guy that was actually, um, oh, I, 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 yeah, it's a Navy, Navy SEAL. And he used to hunt in the Arizona mountains and he had to quit doing it. He quit sending me hides. And I said, well, what's the deal? How come I can't get any more pelts? And he goes, man, it's too dangerous. And I go, you're a freaking SEAL, man. It's too dangerous. And he goes, yep, until a door. So the drug trade would enter the mountains where he hunted. Well, that guy was like, no way am I going down there. There's crazy people there. Well, all right. So this guy has a private ranch that borders Arizona and Mexico, and it's a big size farm. And then they do all the that's why he has all the different species of quails. And where am I headed with this? I did the American soft hackle uh, set. So you get the bob white, you get a, a, a scale quail, you get a, um, a gambles quail and a rough grouse for 90 bucks. So then you have an assortment of stuff to deal with. They're nice pelts, they're well done and they're pretty hard to get. So I thought that was a good idea. And the, the hunter, um, Oh, I'm supposed to, uh, if anybody was interested in doing a gambles quail hunt and wants to blast some really good birds, I will get you his card and his number. Um, he's really a great guy. And if I'm sure he would put you right onto the birds. So uh, they have a weird season because I think usually they are done like in March because it gets way, way hot down there and they hunt in the January, February, March. So usually I get these shipments late spring from the guide. The Bob Whites came from another place from a farm. So, um, but we've got a pretty good supply of those. What's weird is when I get an inventory of this, I'll get a whole bunch of something and then I won't get anything for a long time. And that's part of the challenge of doing this business is to keeping a consistent supply without going broken buying too many things. So um hey, let's mike, see. Bro, mike real quick that yeah. did you just did you, you you said a 
kind of telling that story there. Did you off was that offered as a bundle? With, yeah, I've got a bundle. Okay, yeah. so the the can you review that real quick? The bundle was what was that? Uh, you get the two quails, these two quails, and you get this one, plus a grouse. Plus the so grouse. What, plus the grouse, ninety bucks. And normally I sell one of the hides for thirty bucks, so pretty good deal. You basically get one free. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Um, that's about it for show and tell. Wow, I got a whole extra time left. Um, <laughs> there is one fly I could do to close up if you want to wait a few minutes while I get some stuff. Maybe Matt could talk about raffle tickets or something. Yeah, well, yeah, um, take, take the time you need, Mike, um, um, to get set up with what you want to do there. Um, um, first of all, I want to thank you for doing this, number one, and thank you to, for TC for doing this setup and preparing this. Um, uh, for most of us on the line here, Kirk has sent out a couple notes um, on our fishing trips we have coming up. That's exciting. Um, we have our rod raffle. Uh, so please make note of the communication that uh, Kirk sent out of how we access the rod raffle tickets. Um, I'll be uh, buying some uh, to pick up hopefully win <laughs> and uh and then we have a our keynote speaker kelly gallup uh, uh, uh partnering with the ithaca leon chandler group here for our may talk so we're really pumped about that um i wanted to ask kirk kirk do we have a pulse on how many people we're expecting for that talk uh matt this is uh, a big learning experience for us yeah uh, Normally, a Facebook event is uh, one of our Facebook events. We have 100 views. We have 10 to 20 people reply. And we last meeting, we got 50 people that showed up. OK? Oh, my gosh. Now, contrast that the Kelly Gallup view, I haven't looked at it for about four days. But we had over 5,200 views we had over a hundred replies. Holy so um, the, the event has gone a little bit, a little bit viral, we'll have to see. Uh, but what I would encourage you to do is, um, is to join through Facebook. Um, if you wanna get your raffle tickets, get them before the meeting. Uh, we're expecting, um, a really big response. So uh, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. This is a total learning experience, but all indications are we're gonna get a great response. Wow. Yeah, that, that'll be uh, certainly a learning experience. If we have, I mean, upwards of a hundred people in a Zoom, that'll be um, interesting. To... We've actually increased uh, for the for the month, we've increased the capacity of our Zoom license from 100 to 500. Wow. Just just anticipating that we may need it. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So so it, it'll be cool. Uh, it's certainly going to tax uh, our ability to host. But and, and we won't be able to have open mics like we might on a normal meeting. Mm -hmm. Uh, you'll have to ask your questions through chat, uh, that kind of thing. Right. The other thing I mentioned uh, while we're talking about it, Matt, is um, the response to the fishing trips have been great. Uh, I would encourage you to get your reservations in uh, and your get prepaid for the uh, the Rainbow Paradise trip. Uh, that's that's on its way to filling up. So we have, I believe this Saturday was the Kiyuta trip, which John Lively was coordinating with TC. And then following that was the Memorial outing, I believe. I gotta look at the calendar, but that's what Kirk uh, just referenced there. So yeah, yeah we, we go, go ahead, Kirk, sorry. 
Yeah, uh, well, TC's there. Uh, they and John is on the line, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that that's coming up on Saturday, the Kyoto trip, and then uh, on uh, Feb and May first is the Bill Wirtz, uh Pond outing. Uh, so lots lots of trips uh, coming up. Yeah. We're we're full we're in full gear right now. Oh, one question I had for you, Mike. Yeah. Uh, soft tackles stuff. Uh, yep. Do you have any of the uh, Pearsalls Gossamer silk? Well, what's happened with Pearsalls is there's a company called Morris. Morris Silk bought out Pearsalls. Pearsalls went out of business in 2013. And so Morris essentially has the remainder of all the Pearsalls. Now, the problem is that Morris got put on shutdown. So a lot of their employees got furloughed and they can't sit there and make spools of thread. I have some. So uh, I think the purple and the orange is out, but I have a lot of the other colors of the Morris. Okay. The 54 Dean Street is a pretty darn good substitute if you haven't used that before. And that is pretty reasonable. I actually cut the price on that because I got a little better dealer deal and you have just as many colors on that, if not more. And actually, uh, those guys on 54 Dean Street did a pretty good job because the yellow, they backed it up and matched the old original yellow, not the lemon yellow. It's a kind of an antique yellow. Um, so those are pretty nice. So to answer your question, I have some. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Um, okay. So we're at Hendrickson time right now. And... Um, this is a really effective fly. It's the Hendrickson wet fly. And I don't know if you guys have ever tied one of these, but it's not very hard. All right, so I got a 3906, but you could use a 3906B. You wanna use the light thread. Now the really magical, cool stuff. Can you see that? All right, this is the authentic urine stained, uh, pea stained fox. It's unlike any of the stuff. Usually you get that Hendrickson pink color. They got fluorescent pink, they got hot pink, they got baby pink. No, this is mixed with pale pink, gray, and fawn. So the key is on this that it comes from the underside of the fox We'll be polite tonight and call it the urine burned fox. Um, and uh, it, that's how it gets the texture of that. There is a very tiny patch. And when you deal with this, you're going to have to pull out the guard there. So you snip off a bunch and you take off the guard there. Okay. So you want to try to get all that stuff off of there. Now, the other key critical part to that is, ooh, the cool stuff, wood duck. So you're gonna, now to get a wood duck tail straight, hold this at 45, grab the bunch, and now snip this. And now if you look, I got a little grounder in there, but those tail fibers are pretty darn straight. So you set that equal to the hook shank, hold it up over the top. Well, that's a little bit more. Uh, let's back. All right, that's a little better. You can make this all the way up to a 10, and I don't think it's going to matter one bit. All right, so you want to lay that on the top, and then I'm going to wind back. Now, let me see if I've got silver wire, which is a pretty favorite of mine. I had some. Yeah, that's gold. It's going to have to do tonight. I usually put silver wire on this. This is gold wire. But silver would be my first choice. Put a little wire on there. And then we're going to run the fox up. Okay, so I have my lovely piece. 
And now you take a section of this and then you're gonna lay the tips in. And then it will make it tapered. And it has fairly long fibers. Yeah, it's a little clumpy. And I'm gonna let me pull that off. Yeah. Oh, I put too much in there. Let's stick that down some more. All right. I run the rib forward. All right, now to make your rolled wing, you take the wood duck feather and you're going to strip out that bottom bit. And then you're going to grab this in a bunch and you want it to taper backwards like that. And you make a one loop, two loop. This is why if you have a little bit longer hook, that might do a better job. And then you'd run down here. And we're gonna put a hackle in here yet. And now you can pull the wing up and go underneath. Now this is what you used to call sandy done. This is medium tan done. And when you do a wet fly hackle, you need to have the fibers go a little bit bigger than what the hook shank is. So it should taper back as a cone. All right, so let's see. Okay, I'm gonna clip off this bottom bit. All right, so you tie this in. Let me see if I did this right. Now you want only about one or two. Did your battery quit there? Mm, I think I just heard it shut off. Yeah, yeah. yeah no. What was the other one? Did your battery lost, die? We lost the, uh, the camera at the, at the vice. All right, so I'm gonna do the weapon. That's pretty much it. So you use the tan dubbing, wood duck tail, wood duck wing, and use a, a tan feather in the front. And that is your Hendrickson wet fly. Looks like it'd be a, a, a good fly to have if you're fishing uh, Uta Creek uh, in the near future. Yep, and you can pin a little glue on here, and uh, but you do want the fibers to bend back to see where the see where that bend of the hook is. So you want that oversized a little bit. I did have a little notch in there that is a little heavy wing on there. Normally I do a little bit finer thread, but I just grabbed what I had. So that would be a really easy one for you to do. I wanted to show the really cool traditional stuff because some people have probably never seen the real color. That is nowhere near fluorescent pink. I don't know if I can put that against something else that might show up a little better. Let me see, try this. What does that do? Can you see that any better? No. Worse? Yeah. 
about this? How about that? Yeah, that looks great. Uh, just uh, drop your finger down a little bit. Here we go. All right. So, can you see the mix of the gray, the pink, and the the tan? This one? Or which your one? Your middle finger on the hand that's pinching the stuff. Yeah, look. Okay. okay. How about that? There you go. Perfect. All right. Can you see that? Okay, and then the other difference is look on the wood duck. If you look at real wood duck, real wood duck has a very fine taper to it, not that clumpy mallard. So mm -hmm. there's a difference in the texture of the feather. My so the, color, what color thread are you using? Uh, I've got just white. You can use white or use tan. If you want to use a light color, you could use light gray. If you put black in there, it's going to darken the fly. And I usually the bugs don't have the orange i don't like using orange on those um uh i was out saturday and there were a lot of hendrickson's coming out and i wished i kept looking through my box and i of course i left those ones like that in the truck but i did use a similar color one on a clean camera and had that really good luck with that they were striking that uh but this is that uh that's the light dun color on the feather let me see if i can show that so that's the, the tan done. But you use the dark, it's, I don't know. Some people like the dark on that, but I, I've always had better luck with the light color. And I think that's far more effective. Um, so anyway, has anybody got any questions? No, it looks like a, I'm a huge fan of that style. And I like fishing that uh, on the swing. And uh, you'll, you can, catch, you'll catch a lot of fish on that. You can try switching to a muskrat with that and do the dark tail with brown then. Mm -hmm. And then on, I do a March brown, which has a hare's ear, and then I use turkey for the wing and then a brown hackle. And, oh, that's a fish slayer. Oh, man, that one year I just wore them out. Um, I think I was up on Salmon Creek, and I might have caught 50 fish off of that one day. So uh, they were just wouldn't leave it alone. And, and then that I split the wing and it started to wear out. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm still catching fish. I'm not going to change it. So, cool. yeah. Um, I don't know. Has anybody got any other questions? Doesn't, doesn't appear so. I just want to, again, thank you, Mike, for taking the time to do this. You'll be certainly get a call from me. I do that golden plover. <laughs> It's tempting, yep. Um, yep. but you know, thanks again. And, and th ATC, thank you very much for taking the time and setting, helping Mike get set up here. It's uh, much appreciated. Um, you know, Mike, you're closing out a series for us. Um, you know, we had a great lineup and uh, you were a part of that. And uh, I hope, I hope we can continue doing this series into, um, into the uh, maybe start restart up in December. I was going to talk to Kirk about the details of that, but uh, I think we have something cool going on here with, you know, kind of a silver lining with, you know, this uh, work from home and ending up with Zoom. I think we kind of found a nice little niche here, but we can see that we can see what you're doing. You know, there, you know, in previous, you know, back in person, we'd all be huddled around you, and that's not really cool right now. But with the investment we made through this camera technology we have in the club, and we're all getting, I think we're all fairly confident in Zoom, this has opened a lot of opportunity for us. And, and thank you for being part of this and help us, helping us learn more throughout the way here. Um, well, I think, yeah, go ahead. The one, the one thing that uh, my wife has tossed out, she had to switch her business to Zoom and virtual. And she's got international customers that she never had. She's got people from out of state. She's got people that are remote. I mean, you think about all the different ways to communicate with people and why didn't we do this before? I mean, a lot of times it's a hassle for me to get in the car, drive to Elmira, drive back, do the thing. You guys come up here, all that stuff. Okay, maybe we got to switch to a model where you got this blended thing, you know, some of both. Um, makes it convenient. I can sit in my chair. I don't have to go anywhere, plug it in, listen to the stuff, participate, not participate. 
And, yeah. you know, I, I think this is great. I really yeah. do. I think you guys are really onto something and it's good that you latched onto that. The other thing is just because one thing changes doesn't mean you can't change. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did we want to quit fishing? No. But what we didn't want to do is hang out with weird people we don't know anything about now. Right. Well, yeah, yeah I'm not too keen on that either. Um, consequently, I fish pretty much by myself for a whole year. Am I ready for something else? Yep. Yep. Uh, but uh, I thought I'd toss that out there because my wife had no idea that that other audience was there before she was just reaching her local people. Right. Right. Well, again, thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone for joining tonight. Again, we're going to make this available on YouTube. I'll post to our Facebook page, if not tonight, in the next couple of days when I have it rendered and it's uploaded to YouTube. Um, if no one has any more questions, uh, we'll adjourn uh, for the evening. And uh, we all hope to see you, if not at um, the our well-published uh, and, and uh, marketed Kelly Gallup talk, certainly on one of the other club outings. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'll end the, uh, the Zoom here and uh, everyone have a good night. Thanks, uh, Thanks Matt, for organizing yep. all, Take care. all of these fly tying nights. Uh, I got a lot out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Um, good. More to hopefully more to come in the late fall and the, the winter of next year. So thanks yep. again, That'd everyone. Be great. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. Yep. All right. Ciao. Okay. Have a good night. Nice job, TC. Good night.